Welcome to today's program, The Kidney Project Live, Episode 4, titled The Decade of the Kidney, hosted in partnership with the American Association of Kidney Patients. I'm Ed Hickey, Vice President of the American Association of Kidney Patients and a fellow kidney patient. As a Marine Corps veteran, it's a privilege to also be chair of AAKP's Veterans Health Initiative. As moderator for today's virtual event, I'd like to share a bit about AAKP before we get started, which will lay the framework for our discussion today. AAKP is organized around a central principle, patient consumer care choice. We believe that patients are intelligent consumers of healthcare and deserve a choice in treatments designed to best support their aspirations to pursue their careers, own a home, start a family, and retire securely. Kidney patients have the same dream and desires as any other American. For years, kidney patients have navigated the shortcomings of status quo kidney care, dominated by reliance on brick and mortar dialysis and very little innovation. Mortality rates for hemodialysis stand at over 50% at five years and have worsened recently under the effects of COVID-19. Patient care choice is one of the reasons why in 2018, AKP made the decision to formally partner with the Kidney Project and announce it publicly. The leaders of this innovation initiative are 100% focused on patients and their futures and see patient insights as the key to delivering the artificial kidney to the consumer markets. As individuals suffering from this chronic condition, our partners of the Kidney Project need our help and insights to build a better device. And AAKP has been and continues to be fully committed to our partnership. This endeavor will undoubtedly save lives and revolutionize the future of kidney care. AAKP has accelerated engagement in an expanding international consortium of influencers led by patient consumers and advocates committed to a new era in kidney medicine marked by more inclusive clinical trials, greater use of patient insight data, personalized medicine, and disruptive technologies, including artificial, implantable, and wearable kidneys. This patient-led consortium includes academic and medical researchers, clinical trial designers, innovators, capital market investors, companies, non-governmental and faith-based organizations, as well as elected and appointment government leaders across the globe. Patients are organizing and coordinating their policy and grassroots efforts in a sophisticated effort to advance more common sense, regulatory and payment reforms that prioritize patient needs and fully support the timely entry of new safe products like artificial kidneys into the United States and global consumer markets. I encourage all of you listening to join AAKP and help us advance this device, including through the maze of federal regulations and approvals it will face in the future. AKP's Decade of the Kidney will be marked by successes like the Kidney Project. AKP and the doctors you are about to meet are fully committed to, to disrupting status quo kidney care in America and across the globe. If patient consumers make our demands and needs for innovation known, I'm confident we will see this device enter the consumer market in our lifetimes. Without further ado, I'd like to now welcome Dr. William Fassell, Medical Director of the Kidney Project and Associate Professor of Clinical Medicine at Vanderbilt University Medical Center, along with Dr. Shuvo Roy, Technical Director of the Kidney Project and Professor of the Departments of Bioengineering and Therapeutic Sciences and Surgery at the University of California, San Francisco. Both doctors are also 2022 recipients of the AKP Medal of Excellence. Congratulations, gentlemen, and welcome. Shuvan Bill, be let's begin by no, glad to have you. Let's begin by asking both of you to share how you became involved in your kidney work. Dr. Fassell, we'll start with you. Thanks, Ed. Um, it's been a, a bit of a circuitous journey for me. I went to college in the 1980s, and to be honest, I absolutely hated it. And in the mid 80s, I dropped out of college and was shifting about for something to do. And I found myself eventually working as an emergency medical technician in the suburbs around Boston. And in that era, 
A lot of patients who depended on dialysis also depended on an ambulance to move them from home to the dialysis unit and back to home again. And so in this work as an EMT, I had the opportunity to meet some of the patients of that era who depended on dialysis for life. And this was a very different era than today. So I remember this one woman who uh, was in a halo. Uh, she had a, a titanium bracket holding her skull up off of her shoulders because the renal osteodystrophy had ruined her spine. She was pale as a piece of paper because she was anemic because erythropoietin wasn't on the market yet. She was in constant pain. She was constantly short of breath. And yet you could tell just a moment's conversation with her that there was this fire alive inside her. She wanted more life. She wanted more time. She wanted to see her grandchildren. And this, this inspired me. I mean, I was perfectly healthy. If this woman suffering the burdens of disease every moment can be this alive, I, I who am healthy, I can do anything. And so that set me on the path of trying to engineer a better treatment for these patients. And then it was almost a decade later, more than a decade later, that I was, um, I finally made the connection between some relatively esoteric engineering work I'd done as an undergraduate and the shape and the architecture of kidney filters. And I said, aha, maybe we can move the needle on therapy for patients by by taking this technology from the microelectronics industry and applying it to unmet needs in the dialysis space. And I was incredibly fortunate. At that time, I was finishing my residency at, at Case Western in Cleveland to uh, meet Dr. Shuva Roy, who was already working on some of the exact technology that was needed to start this project going. And so that was the that was the initiative that got me interested in trying to do better for the patients that I see every day. Shuvo. I don't come from a clinical background. I'm an engineer. Um, I was also wrapping up my work at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio, and was starting a new position at the Cleveland Clinic Research Institute. And my mandate was to find role for technology in medicine. And my training was in the area of sensor technology, the same technology used to make electronics, to make sensors, and especially sensors that were small, cheap, and smart. A ubiquitous example of that technology is the production of airbag sensors in our cars. It's nothing more than a small electromechanical unit that's carved out of semiconductor silicon. So I was going to use that technology and go into industry, but as I was wrapping up, I felt that maybe there would be opportunities to use that technology in medicine. And I was fortunate to join the Cleveland Clinic Research Institute. And right around that time, I ran into Bill who asked me, what are you gonna work on? I said, well, I, I have a hammer. I'm looking for nails and looking for problems to work on. And being astute as he was, he pointed me to the field of kidney disease. And I remember him pointing out a dialysis machine at the time. And we talked about how we might use this technology from semiconductor electronics that was enabling miniaturization to make smaller dialysis machines that could be more compact, more transportable. And I said, gosh, yeah, I know how to make control systems from my training. I know how to make sensors and with the technology can be adapted to make things like pumps and whatnot. So that's my, the beginning of how I got interested. And with discussions with Bill, we, I started realizing that this was a significant unmet need and Bill pointed out 
the technologies that were used a decade ago for treating patients with kidney failure were not that different from what is being used at that time, except maybe the machines that I was seeing at the time had LCD screens and the previous generation had knobs and CRTs, cathode ray tubes. And so bringing the latest semiconductor technology proved intellectually very intriguing to me. As we worked on this, we began to realize that yes, we could make a better dialysis machine, but maybe we're making a better Band-Aid. And as I started asking these questions of Bill, we both recognized that it might be possible to take a step forward and create something that goes beyond dialysis and can provide treatment that is closer to an organ transplant. And at the time, I remember getting excited and I said to Bill, you know, how feasible is this? And Bill, to his credit, said, actually, there's a group at the University of Michigan that's tackling the idea of combining mechanical components with cell therapy to provide more native kidney-like treatment to patients in the ICU. And that began the journey of thinking about our implantable artificial kidney. We went over to Michigan, met with the pioneer there, Dr. David Humes, a nephrologist, who was actually treating sick patients in the ICU with kidney failure with his device he called the renal assist device that combined continuous renal replacement therapy with cells as adjunct and was able, was able to show through a series of preclinical and clinical studies that those benefit. So then I felt here was the fundamental science being demonstrated. Could we bring the engineering toolkit and use that to build an implantable device to provide many of the key benefits of a kidney transplant. And that has been the journey we call the kidney project. And now uh, and this is all captured in a video we put together that we'll play that talks about the journey of the kidney project and the status today. People living with kidney failure can soon look forward to a future without dialysis or an endless wait for a transplant organ. Combining continuous treatment with total mobility, the implantable bioartificial kidney will give patients back their health, freedom, and quality of life. The compact device will replicate many functions of healthy kidneys and will not require immunosuppression drugs. The bioartificial kidney combines a mechanical hemofilter to remove toxins from blood and a bioreactor containing engineered renal tubule cells to maintain water volume, electrolyte balance, and metabolic functions. Highly efficient membranes constructed from semiconductor silicon wafers enable filtration without requiring pumps or electrical power while protecting the renal cells from rejection by the patient's immune system. The biocompatible device attaches to the circulatory system and removes toxins to the bladder as waste. After a decade of engineering development to refine the hemofilter and bioreactor components, preclinical prototypes of the implantable bioartificial kidney have been successfully created. Clean room microfabrication processes have been established to reliably produce high quality silicon membranes. Tissue culture protocols have also been optimized to reproducibly grow renal tubule cells and maintain their function. The silicon membranes were mounted in polycarbonate housing to construct hemofilters and in similar fashion, bioreactors were assembled to immunoprotect the renal tubule cells. The hemofilter and bioreactor components were then connected to create bioartificial kidney prototypes for benchtop and preclinical testing. 
In proof of concept experiments, the hemofilter operated under blood pressure alone, without systemic anticoagulation, while the renal cells in the bioreactor remained alive and healthy without immunosuppression. Further improvements will scale up the prototypes with additional silicon membranes and renal cells, creating clinical devices that can demonstrate sustained treatment of kidney failure in human trials. The implantable bioartificial kidney will provide the therapy and mobility patients need to move beyond the burdens of dialysis and organ shortage, and once again enjoy the freedoms of everyday life. That's just incredible. Can you, uh, Shivo and Bill, can you tell us a little bit about why you came up with the solution as opposed to say a wearable dialysis device? Bill? Sure, Ed. This is um, something that we've talked about at great length. And the those of you who are familiar with dialysis have seen that the one constant over the years in every dialysis unit is water. There's always water on the floor, there's a water treatment room, there's water piping, there's water tubing, there's water testing, because you need a huge volume of water to clear waste products out of the blood. And that's fundamentally a barrier to mobility, to patients being able to move around, to travel. And so what we needed was a way to concentrate wastes out of blood into a little small volume like your kidneys do, like making urine. And so there's a number of different approaches that have been tried over the years. There's sorbent dialysis with cartridges that you replace. And there's, there's devices that are in trials and coming to the market that work like that. But the problem with that approach just like the problem with dialysis is that there's something that breaks the skin there's if you have a disposable if you've got fluid that you have to pump in and out of a patient or you've got sorbent beds and carbon and so on that you have to replace a couple times a day you're going to have something that breaks the skin and that's a conduit for infection that's the Achilles heel of dialysis from start to finish is the fact that you have these tubes that come in and out of the patient and these are an avenue for an infection. Once we broach the idea to ourselves that our goal was a continuously functioning device that was inside the patient 24 seven, that the light bulb went off that this would not just be somehow more convenient for patients, but this would also change what it meant to be a patient who depended on some device to live to replace their kidneys. This kind of roller coaster effect of building up fluid that's then removed in a couple of hours, a couple of times a week that stresses the heart, stuns the heart. The kind of on and off nature of dialysis that doesn't allow your phosphorus in your food to leave your body through the dialysis machine. If we have around the clock kind of therapy that's always working, like your kidneys always working, those problems vanish. And so patients will be able to eat and drink what they want. Patients will recover their cardiac health. There's ample evidence from nocturnal dialysis programs, for example, that this is, that this this works, this is eminently possible. And so we then had to find a way to concentrate waste products out of blood so that you could clean hundreds of liters of blood a day, circulating again and again and again through a device, but then have only you know, a liter or two, a little volume that you had to excrete because otherwise you'd, you'd have to have water all around you. You'd have to be like a fish. And so we chose to follow nature's blueprint. And that was to use kidney cells that work to separate toxins and poisons and drugs and waste products from the salts and water and glucose and amino acids, the constituents of blood that you do need. And that has been the focus 
focus of our work for the last 15 or 20 years is to develop the enabling technologies that will let us build <clears throat> an implantable device that will look and act like a transplanted kidney, be under the skin, no power lines, no dialysate catheters, no battery packs, no sorbent cartridges, but will get patients enough waste product removal and fluid removal that they don't have to go to a dialysis unit three times a week. This is not going to be a perfect kidney. We are not so arrogant to think that we're going to make something that's going to be better than what nature evolved or God created. But what we can do using Shuvo's wizardry with silicon micromachining and modern cell culture and genome engineering techniques, we can make something that is just about like a kidney with filters like kidneys have and cells that sort out what the body wants to keep and what the body wants to excrete. And between those two, that kind of opens the window for a new era for patients with renal failure. That it might just be possible to overcome the scarcity problem in kidney transplant, not by promoting organ donation, which is great, but by engineering a device that will be just good enough that patients will be able to go about their lives as if they didn't have kidney disease at all. That's where this all started, Ed. Well, thank you. Shubo, do you have anything to add to that? I think the way I think about what Bill just said is really about alleviating suffering. Now, I'm a professor, I do research, I do teaching, but in research, you're thinking about the breakthroughs that are discovery based, but I have refocused my program to get to a solution that will help patients suffer less or not suffer. And in this system, I see a device, the artificial kidney providing continuous treatment so that it's not the three times a week intermittent therapy that dialysis patients have to undergo. The patient has the freedom to travel, freedom of mobility. They're not encumbered by a machine tethering them. By having the device all inside, would be able to minimize the infection risks associated with through the skin um, needle, needle or catheter connections. By having cells in our device, we'll provide more physiological treatment, hence better health. And when we engineer this right, we believe that we can put the cells inside our device and isolate them from the patient's immune system so they won't need anti-rejection drugs. So again, if we put all this together, and again, to Bill's point, not create a perfect kidney that does 100% of what a healthy kidney does, but hits on those parameters that allow us to provide continuous treatment, freedom of mobility, less infection risk, better physiological outcomes, and no immunosuppression, will have alleviated suffering. And that's what we are focused on. And doing that through an implanted system that combines a filtration unit with a cell therapy unit is the way to go. Thank you. The um, next question I have is for both of you, and, and it, it goes to uh, patients whose lives have been impacted and informed by your journey on this project. Like our friend Brian Hess, a former AKP board of director who was a staunch supporter of the Kidney Project prior to his passing in 2020. Can you tell me the impact that the people like Brian uh, have had? Yeah, Shuvo, if it's okay, I'll take this. So I am fundamentally hired as a, as a scientist. Um, I have a laboratory here at Vanderbilt, but I also see patients in clinic. I see patients in the hospital just before this webinar started. I was up visiting a patient who was admitted on eight cell. You know, 
the knowledge that individual patients lives are touched by this this is the emotional fuel for the cognitive engine this is the fire that keeps us going year in and year out this is why we're motivated to do this so brian was a phenomenal ambassador for renal disease brian was absolutely a pistol pushing every moment would not take no for an answer would not accept you know oh later as an answer wanted solutions and wanted solutions that he could touch and feel and see. And every single patient that I meet in the office wants to live, wants to do something, has a goal, has a dream, has a desire. And every single patient that I meet in the office is terrified of having to initiate dialysis because they know because they've had friends who've initiated dialysis, coworkers who've initiated dialysis. They know, they sense that there's a way in which starting dialysis is the beginning of the end for them. And they don't want to give up what they have. They want to see grandchildren. They want to see their children get married. They want to see their grandchildren graduate from high school. And so this is the flame that keeps us burning. This is why we persevere year in and year out to try to make this happen. Shiva? Absolutely. I, I had a chance to meet Brian um, the year before the pandemic. And although I had heard from him via email and heard him speak, I got a chance to meet him at one of the AAKP sponsored events in Washington, D.C. at the George Washington University. What an inspiration Brian was. He basically came out and said, look, I support your goal. Let, tell me what I can do to help. And what struck me about Brian was here's a person who is clearly not in the best of health, the relative to the whole population, but he was fighting. And he said, look, we can't stop. We need to get this done. And reflect what Bill said earlier, if somebody like Brian can take this on, who am I to say this is too tough? So Brian inspired me, and over the years, I've met many patients, uh, some in AAKP, some associated with AAKP, some of them outside of this organization in a formal sense. But the patients are the true heroes. They get up every day and make it through the day. And they keep on doing this despite all the challenges they have. And one of the points of feedback I've heard over and over again was, Dr. Roy, yes, this is a challenge that you have, you're going to have to overcome in terms of getting the technology to patients. And there are all kinds of burdens you have to address. Don't give up. Second, don't worry about making something perfect. Our lives are such that improvements will be transformative for us. And what struck with me when I heard that was the phrase Bill uses, don't let perfect become the enemy of the good. So instead of trying to create the whole kidney function, we know healthy kidneys, as Bill has educated me, seven plus functions, focus on the key that improves the quality of life and provides better health. So that's what is our focus. And we can do that using an engineering strategy and alleviate suffering. So patients have inspired me, keep us grounded as a team as to what we need to deliver. And we love the enthusiasm for the patients for what we do, but also appreciate the challenges they undergo. And that I think sensitizes us that this is a mission of urgency. This is not a 50 year research project that somebody else will solve. We have to do everything we can to solve it. And thanks to folks like Brian and others to keep us going on that mission. Thank you, Shivo. Brian was an inspiration to us all and I think drives us in our desire to, to see projects like yours succeed. Um, Shivo, can you tell us what the current status of the project is? Sure. So Bill gave a high level um, 
uh, picture of you know how the project got started and i sort of alluded in the video of the key steps we've taken but if i was to break it down we started off with a vision that was driven by bill that we need an implanted device that will allow patients mobility eat and drink freely and just have better health so using that set of user needs that's engineering speak we developed specifications we developed specifications for a filtration unit which we call the hemofilter and specification for the cell therapy unit which we call the bioreactor and specifications range from operational parameters meaning how much filtration does it perform how what will the cells actually do to the size of the device so once we had those specifications we undertook the tasks to design components on the computer and then test them on the benchtop and then evaluate them in preclinical studies with animals to optimize their performance. So we did that for the silicon membrane. We did that for the silicon membrane to create the filter. We are doing that for the cells and putting the cells again into the housing. And we demonstrated in the mid 2010s that we could make a filter that operates without the need for electromechanical pumps, just on blood pressure alone, without the need for blood thinning drugs. We also showed the cells would function inside the device and be alive despite being exposed to the in vivo implanted environment where the immune components and show that the cells function. So we showed the hemofilter by itself operated. And then we show that the bioreactor by itself operated. And then right around the pandemic, uh, we got seri seriously slowed down, but we're able to continue and create our first demonstration, which is bring together the filter unit with the cell therapy unit, put them together into the reality of what was once a vision, the implantable bioartificial kidney, and then tested it in pig, as you saw, and to generate urine. For the first time, showing that the filter and the cell therapy unit can work in tandem just on blood pressure alone, without blood thinners, without anti-rejection drugs to create urine and not have an adverse effect on the pig. So that is the status of the project. And we're very excited that this is the culmination of something that Bill's vision was over you know, two decades ago when, when he was finishing up his residency. And I'm pleased that I was part of it to show that it can be a reality at this stage. And the Wonderful. key to this is that we took an engineering approach where we took the state of the art knowledge and created components as opposed to coming up with coming to create new discoveries that then would have to be translated into a, a prototypes. So what needs to happen before the trials can start and how long do you think it'll take? Well, that's a great question. And we get that question so, so, so often, and it's a, it's a, it's a valid question. So, People, you know, will see our presentations and they'll hear other people talk about our work and say, gosh, you've made so much progress. When can we get this you know, into the patients? So it's probably instructive to think about how devices go from discovery, engineering, testing to patients and then beyond. So for us, what we did was because we wanted to show proof of principle and the fact that we had limited resources in terms of personnel and in terms of finances. We focused on showing proof of concept that the two components could work in tandem and produce urine. So what we did was build the, the prototype that you saw in that video with just limited number of cells and limited surface area for filtration integrate that together and produce urine. 
that pig did not have compromised kidneys. That pig was otherwise healthy. We wanted to test the ability of our device to at least show the feasibility of producing urine, and we did that successfully. So how do we move forward is the question you're asking. Well, we need to increase the number of cells that we need to put into the device, and we need to increase the amount of filter surface area that's packed into the device. If we can pack enough area and enough cells, we'll achieve a device that has the capacity to have a therapeutic benefit, which means that if it was implanted in an animal or presumably a patient that had compromised kidneys, the device would have enough capacity to treat it. So what we showed was pro uh, prototypes that showed feasibility but did not have therapeutic capacity. So we need to be able to scale up the technology and build prototypes that will show therapeutic effect in animals first. Do that in a way that we can take that data to the FDA and the institutional review boards to show them that we have feasibility data that's conducted to provide therapeutic you know, in a way that's robust and is capable of providing therapeutic benefit and get their approvals to move to humans. And how long will that take? Is really not so much a question of decades, question of years. And the technology plan we have, it, you know, tells us we can achieve that within four years, assuming all the resources were there to make it happen and there's no unanticipated challenges which uh, might show up. And in terms of resources, you mean financial resources as well as as human resources to assist you with the with the research? I think it's both, but I think the financial resources is important to at least appreciate. So the way research gets done in this country, especially health research, uh, is done usually through National Institutes of Health funding. And we've been very fortunate to have had received funding from the NIH to develop the technology that I showed you in the video. Uh, we were recipients of uh, grants that allows us to construct the membranes, build proof of concept prototypes. And we had a point where, you know, we now need to think about scale up. To get this funding for scale up is not so much at NIH as it is outside of NIH in the traditional conventional medical uh, technology industry, you go to investors and investors then say, okay, you know, you've shown proof of concept, then let's uh, see how we can scale up and move it forward. And so we'll have to find uh, groups outside of NIH to move it forward because we had a point where the NIH funding for showing this initial proof of concept may not be there for the scale up that we need we need to go forward. And the challenge is, is that, as we all know, you know, funding in general for kidney is limited uh, compared to cancer, compared to AIDS. Kidney disease gets a lot less funding, and that makes it harder to find supporters in the private uh, investment community for supporting kidney innovations. But that's what would be needed to advance this towards a product. Bill, do you want to say anything? Yeah, sure. I think, Chivo, you, you hit the nail right on the head. Um, the, the National Institutes of Health and the National Institute for Biomedical Imaging and Bioengineering has been incredibly generous in getting this project off the ground. The NIH funds basic science questions. The goal of NIH grants is to generate answers that everyone can use. When we've advanced past these germinal questions, these foundational can we do it questions, um, to what's actually product development, which is, for example, finding a silicon foundry that will make 
huge numbers of these silicon wafers, you know, provided coming up with the money to hire a foundry to stop making iPhones or airbag sensors or, or whatever else they might be making out of silicon and make kidneys, that's, that takes cash. And that's not cash that's answering fundamental questions about biology or about physics. That's product development. And so that moves out from under the NIH's umbrella. Um, and the parallel to that is exactly what Shubo described, that this, what we're, where we are now is not discovery. Where we are now is engineering. It's applying existing discoveries to build cost-effective solutions to alleviate patient suffering. And so we are maybe victims of our own success that we've met every milestone of every NIH grant that we've ever been awarded. Um, and we've gotten to the point now where we're expected to leave the nest. We're expected to fledge um, and, and go find food for ourselves. And that, that could be a steep hill. I can imagine that just the challenges that you face with the the investors. It just seems like with, say, you need $10 million with, with this need, um, it, it shouldn't be that hard to find money. But I guess with the the, the need for a proof of concept and um, getting the money to scale up, it's just uh, it, it's it's a real particular challenge. Um, what beyond uh, getting the remaining NIH grants that you're eligible for. Is there anything else that you're that you're looking for to do the animal studies? Yeah, so we actually work with, um, you know, whenever we can write a grant, we try to write a grant and sometimes we get it. Often we are we don't get it, but that's, you know, we keep going. But where we've had uh, real uh, advance is when we've had donations. Often it's patients sending in, you know, sometimes tens of dollars, sometimes a few thousand dollars, but we've added those up to really advance the project. So, and if the more of those kinds of uh, donations, they do add up. And I think it's really important that we keep going because we need to get that to that proof of concept data then and, and sh that we can show an investor and get the dollars then even more to scale up. So sometimes we'll hear people say, go talk to the people who are giving money, billions of dollars, the billionaires out there. Why don't you go talk to them? We do, but the billionaires have their own priorities. And as some of you already know, people give what's close to them. And most of the people that, I'm gonna just throw out names, Bill, you know, Bill Gates, you know, Elon Musk, uh, and McKenzie Scott, um, they have their priorities. And yes, we can reach out to them, but it, it helps if we can have people who are, familiar with kidney disease that are in that category. So I think part of it is raising the awareness and the community can do that. But we are hopeful that using some of the remaining eligibility we have for certain grants at NIH, along with donations and even investments, we might be able to do those key animal studies that will give us the data that then we can go and say, guys, we have the data that now uh, this is poor proof of concept for therapeutic benefit. And then now we need additional money to scale up. So Shivo, in, in 2018, in partnership with the Kidney Project and through AKP Center for Patient Research and Education, AKP deployed a comprehensive online survey to obtain unique qualitative and quantitative data on patient preference, perception, and risk tolerance for new and innovative therapies such as wearable and implantable devices. Can you share with us the value of using patient insight data in the development of devices? Absolutely. So first of all, very uh, pleased that we're able to get AAKP's support to distribute the survey. And for people who may not be aware, you know, one of the questions we have to deal with is, well, you know, when people really get a surgery to get your device, it seems such a, like a high level of risk. Of course, surgery is risky, but then also being on dialysis can be very risky and likely not result in a very long life. So I have these anecdotes from patients saying, of course, I'll do a surgery. And then I have others who are like, well, do I really do a surgery? So Bill and I thought about this and we basically said, let's get a scientific answer to this. So we recruited people who are experts in 
asking patients questions to tease out preference data. And basically one of the key points we learned, which still blows my mind away, is that kidney patients are willing to accept a higher level of risk of surgery and repeated surgeries, by the way, including higher risk of death to a certain level if the implanted artificial kidney allowed them the ability to travel and eat and drink more freely. Wow, that tells you something about their current quality of life and just health. But for us, it's like, this is really important that maybe we don't have to make a device that works for 25 years. Maybe as long as they're willing to come in every few years, if needed, that would be acceptable. So why this data is important is it guides how we design our device, but also we can share this device, this, this uh, patient preference data with the FDA. And as some of you know, the FDA takes into account patient preferences in their review of applications of devices for trials. So this was a, um, important not only for guiding our technology development, but something we hope we can take to the FDA and say, here is the patient perspective, and this is what we have taken into account to design and develop our device. Thank you. That's critical information. And Bill, why does this device matter in terms of care choice? The program for end-stage kidney disease care. We present patients with options for how they want to get treated. And these usually are unfortunately seen as, as kind of, you know, pieces of a finite pie. That there's transplantation, which is clearly associated with the best survival and the best quality of life, but it's incredibly scarce. There's home dialysis therapies, which offer flexibility and convenience and the ability to choose the time and the dose of your own treatment. And then there's in-center dialysis. And when you read the, the regulations, it really sounds like you're offering patients a menu or a buffet. You know, would you prefer the steak or the chicken? And it's not like that. The reality is that transplant is severely limited by scarcity of donor organs. There's 105,000 new patients reaching kidney failure every year in the United States and about 22,000 new kidney transplants a year in the United States. It's fundamentally not really an option for most patients who reach kidney failure. And then if you think about the choice between in-center dialysis and home dialysis, I think most nephrologists, if they could picture themselves as the patient would choose home dialysis, but there's a burden around that. You have to have a place to store the equipment. You have to have a place to store the supplies. You have to be able to accomplish the therapy. You may need to be able to stick needles in your arms. Um, there's a threshold of ability and complexity and social stability that's associated with the idea of choosing home dialysis. And so my perception as a nephrologist who pushes patients towards home therapy, if they fall through the cracks of prevention and end up needing dialysis, you know, my perception is that we lay out these choices, but patients generally feel hemmed in, as I guess how I would say it, that one idea or another might sound nice to them, but the reality to them is that there's really only one thing that's practical for them. And that's why in-center dialysis is the predominant treatment mode for renal failure in the United States right now. The reason why our device is important, is crucial, is it lowers the barriers. It's something that we are creating something that anybody can do. We're creating something that anybody can have. It doesn't require immunosuppression. So if you've had a cancer or you've got an ongoing diabetic foot ulcer or, or, or not a barrier, it doesn't require pallets and pallets and pallets of fluid to be stacked up in your living room. It doesn't require your own personal water treatment plant in your house. So it doesn't require you to have a house. 
so when we think about what we're doing and the goal of an implantable artificial kidney, something like this, something that's very real, and resources are the only thing that stand between us and getting this into patients. We want to bring actual choice to patients so that your medical background, your financial situation, your job situation, your housing situation don't predetermine what you can and can't do. Because fundamentally, whether we like to admit it or not, that's the way it boils out for most patients today. And so if you want to actually have choices about the care you receive, we need to get out of this zero sum game thinking of a finite pie of in-center dialysis or peritoneal dialysis at home or for the few and the proud and the brave home hemodialysis or maybe you, you win the transplant lottery and you get a transplant. We need to change the paradigm. We're desperate for innovation in this space. And Shuvo and I, with the help of AAKP, are trying to make that innovation a reality so that patients can choose the lives that they want to have. Is this going to be the right thing for everybody? Absolutely not. Is it going to work perfectly for everybody? Absolutely not. But we're desperate to have real choices on the table available for patients so that patients who prize the ability to travel, patients who want to be able to go eat a pizza, and not die of hyperkalemia from the tomato sauce. Patients who are craving an orange after years on dialysis, but can't eat it because of the potassium. All of these things, we want to bring real choice to patients. And the way to do that is by introducing new technologies in the market that are going to disrupt that kind of zero sum game mentality that exists today. Wonderful. Bill, do you have any questions for me? Absolutely. Um, all of end-stage kidney disease care happens in the context of payers and regulations. And legislative advocacy and partnerships with patient groups like AAKP are critical components to the success of all of our projects. Ed, can you tell us a little bit about your experience with congressional advocacy and how AAKP has been able to successfully address our congressional leadership for change to improve conditions for kidney patients? Sure, Bill. I, I think, as some of you know, I, I used to work on the Hill and have uh, some familiarity with the, with the process and the importance of, of constituent engagement. And uh, this year alone, we completed over 125 congressional visits, including meetings with the chair of the Kidney Caucus and members of the European Parliament on the need for artificial implantable devices. There's an overwhelming consensus that, that the patients who suffer need support and innovation. And in a few weeks, AAKP will in fact be on the Hill again with another 95 congressional visits scheduled. And that's fantastic that you're able to speak up like that. But are, are patients speaking up with you? Or are, they, are they part of this project? Yeah, every single one of them. I mean, every, every, every single visit ha has a patient there so that the, they're, they're matched with their congressional delegation and they meet either with the member or, or with the staff person responsible for the, the health care decisions or the the, the committee decisions related to kidney care. So in, in every instance, there's a patient there to, to present the patient perspective, experience and voice so that the person who, who may not have a, a great understanding of, of kidney disease because there aren't many nephrologists on the Hill, uh, it, it, they, they bring it they, they humanize it. it. It's not an abstract concept once they get done talking to the patient. Shuvo, do you have anything you'd like to ask me? Yeah, absolutely. 
um, I was going to say, that's really, really impressive with what you do on the Hill. And as, as you're talking, I'm just thinking about how might we learn from AAKP's success in this area to get the support to ensure that the implantable bioartificial kidney can get to patients by the end of the decade. And obviously you have a track record in mobilizing support and awareness. What do you think as the next steps we could leverage for us and how can you see the patient community helping our goal? Thanks, Shiva. So from, from my experience, the, the smartest and most strategic thing your team can do for advocacy organizations like AKP is to keep us engaged on the details of where you are across the product development lifestyle, including early meetings with regulators and payers like CMS. You should request engagements early in the process with CMS. <clears throat> this will be a device the likes of which they have not seen before and it may not have the expertise to consider. FDA will help CMS on this via their internal communications, but you should invite patients to attend every meeting with government officials that you have, and you should take advantage of our research and survey mechanisms to provide patient insight data. AKP has built the most sophisticated and deepest sets in the patient advocacy community and our polling is designed by national experts from the field of social research, media research, and political research. So when we, we go up and we talk to officials, we have data to support what it is we're saying. And, and as, as you referenced, the, the, there are some surprising insights into the mind of a kidney patient that we can offer them that they, they may not have seen before. So Liz, at this point, I think we want to uh, to take some some questions that some of the audience members have posed. Great. Um, yeah, we have a really active chat going on and um, lots of questions are coming in. So um, one of them you, you kind of just spoke to, but um, there's a lot of interest in what patients can do to help other than donate. Um, and people are talking about maybe creating a hashtag to call attention to um, the, the great need for this project. Um, is this something that, uh, how do you recommend that that patients get organized um, in order to do something that can concretely help? Join AAKP would be my first suggestion. If you're not already a member, uh, get, get involved in AAKP directly. We have a very active presence on social media. Our, our Twitter account, our Facebook page uh, is monitored by people on the Hill, by people in government, by uh, people in the industry. And I would suggest that uh, you, you join us and then we, connect, we can connect you with the appropriate people in the appropriate areas. We get requests uh, almost daily for patient insights into uh, issues, new, new devices, new drugs, whatever it is. And if you want to get involved, just, just reach out to us. It's free. And it's the, the, the largest uh, patient, kidney patient organization in the country. So uh, I, I think that's the best first step. And then we can take it from there. Great. Thanks, Ed. That's, that's really helpful. Um, this next question is for uh, Dr. Fazell, And um, a few people are wondering if um, the implantable artificial kidney will be um, useful for patients that have nephrotic syndrome. Oh, what a great question. Um, so we worry as clinicians about nephrotic syndrome. Nephrotic syndrome is, is a clinical, for those of you who don't know, is a clinical condition where the kidneys filters get leaky. And uh, the good stuff that's in blood that you need to be healthy, like antibodies to fight infection or proteins that help your blood clot so you don't bleed to death if you cut yourself, will leak out into the urine through the kidneys filters. And we worry about this because the presence of protein in the urine is probably the single strongest predictor that a patient is going to progress from just having kidney disease to actually having kidney failure. And so... While I don't see a path for our technologies to intervene early 
in nephrotic syndromes, whether they be FSGS or diabetes or membranous, the whole library of troubles that fill my clinic every Wednesday afternoon. Um, what we would like to do is because there are so few effective therapies for severe nephrotic syndrome and pulmonary kidney disease, um, we, we want to create a safety net, as it were, so that patients who have been grappling with immunosuppression and steroids and cytoxin and all of these really scary drugs to treat their nephrotic syndrome know that there's going to be a better choice for them, a better option for them, if all of the diligent work that they're doing, taking their medicines, going to their doctor visits, getting their blood drawn, still culminates in an ultimate loss of kidney function, ends up in, in failure, that they aren't necessarily going to be having to follow the pathway that they may have seen, for example, in family members who might have the same illness of having to, to go to the dialysis center three times a week. So a direct intervention in, in nephrotic syndrome, probably not. You know, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see this interfering with, with the autoimmune processes that cause nephrotic syndrome or the diabetes that causes nephrotic syndrome. But though these patients are the very patients who tend to develop kidney failure. And it's these patients for whom we've put our shoulder to the wheel for 20 years to try to make a gadget, an implantable artificial kidney, that will be good enough that patients don't have to sit waiting year in and year out for something bad to happen to somebody else so a donor kidney becomes available or have to go on dialysis. Thanks. Thanks, Bill. That was really helpful. Um, one more question for you. Um, uh, a few people are wondering um, about when and um, how the clinical trial selection process will help. So, or it will start. So, um, how long um, away from that do you think we are? And um, and what should patients do if they want to be in trials? Uh, so, um, as um, One of my colleagues said um, that my, my colleague here at, at Vanderbilt, who's one of the pioneers in dialysis, um, told me uh, a couple of weeks ago, he said, Bill, I only have two words for you. Hurry up. Um, <laughs> that um, these kinds of innovation are too long overdue. Full stop. And um, we're as eager as anybody to get into clinical trials. Um, and as Shuvo mentioned, there's hard financial stops that stand between us and a clinical trial. And it's not any mystery. This isn't, you know, clouded in, in secrecy. We just need the money to be able to hire somebody to stop making iPhones and airbag sensors and start making kidneys. We need to be able to manufacture enough devices to be able to get through the FDA's sterility requirement testing and biocompatibility testing. And the FDA has been a fantastic partner. I do not want anybody to, to conjure up the idea that, that the FDA is unhelpful or a barrier. The, uh, the group at CDRH has been phenomenal. So we really think about the, the time span from where we are to our first in human trials, almost in terms of money as much as in terms of time. So, you know, adequate resources, we could probably have the technology first being piloted and safety studies inside of 18 months to two years. And Shuvo, feel free to check me on that if I'm wrong. How do you get yourself involved? Um, there's a, a number of different ways. So Elizabeth is our um, social media uh, genius and wizard, uh, and you can always reach out through a Facebook page or something like that to, to get in touch with us. Um, there's a, an email uh, address called kidneyproject at theumc.org, kidneyproject at Vanderbilt University Medical Center.org. And if you send an email there with your contact information, we archive that and keep it so that we can 
find you and say, hey, um, you know, we'd, we'd love to talk to you about, about what the possibilities for a trial are. You know, choosing patients for a clinical trial is something that we talk to the FDA about at, at great length, um, really because we have an absolute mandate to not do harm. I mean, I would love to just surge forward, put these things in everybody, get great data, save lives, be a hero. But, you know, cooler heads will recognize that every patient who reaches renal failure and requires dialysis is at phenomenal risk for epicardial coronary heart disease, has a, a significant cardiac risk uh, to undergo surgery. Um, has significant infection risk, has significant wound healing risk, particularly for patients with diabetes. So we have to look at those factors when we consider the risk benefit of enrolling a patient in a clinical trial when the patient knows, and I know, and the IRB knows, and the FDA knows that the individual patient is not going to get a lasting durable medical benefit from participating in testing of a device. Um, and so the risk to that patient of being involved in the trial has to be very, very low. So while our goal is that every single patient with kidney failure be a candidate for our device, that every single patient with kidney failure avail themselves of the benefits of slow, continuous treatment. Um, for the first patients in a trial, that's probably, we're probably going to have to be a little more choosy thinking about, is it really safe for this patient to undergo a surgery for an implant? Thanks, Bill. Um, so I think uh, we're a couple minutes over now, so we probably should wrap up. Um, just wanted to give um, the very final question to Shuvo. Um, there's one kind of urgent question from the chat, and um, that is, so if we had $10 million today, um, how soon could this device not be in patients, but be on the market? So, uh, or not, not be in trials, but be, be a, a device that's commercially available for, for patients? Sure, happy to try to tackle that one. So I think there's the question of trials and then how do you get to market? And um, I think being successful in the market requires confluence of other factors, right? distribution, manufacturing, et cetera. So we can look to other industries and other medical devices to plot a path out. Given what we know about our work and given what we know about other implanted devices, for example, orthopedic implants, cardiovascular implants, the path to um, trials and beyond. You know, typically, if they're resourced well, they can get through their clinical trials and then scale up in distribution. So we're in 2022 and we have this declared to be the decade of the kidney. I'm confident before the end of the decade that given the resources, we could be on the market because the technology is known. We have to work out the manufacturing and scale up and the distribution, but we also have the partnerships with groups like AAKP, the collaborations uh, with other groups, including our interactions with the FDA and the initiative between the Health and Human Services and American Society of Nephrology, Kidney X, together, I think, allows us to think that by the latter half of this decade, our device could be beyond the trials and in the market, but obviously that's, that calls for a number of factors to fall into place. So it's not a 50 year project. It is not even a 20 year project. I think if we're successful with the clinical trials in, within three to four years, then it's a matter of ramping up and you're looking at a product that's available to all those that need it before the end of the decade. Great. Well, I think that's a perfect place to wrap up um, and I will pass it back over to Ed to uh, close us out. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, it's been a wonderful and insightful program, Dr. Vassell and Dr. Roy, and it's been a pleasure having this conversation with you both today. And I appreciate the opportunity to moderate 
and represent AKP. Uh, in closing, I'd like to thank our audience for listening in. If you didn't get your question answered, you can submit it to kidneyproject at ucsf.edu, uh, University of California, San Francisco, or info at aakp.org, and we'll work to get you a response. Uh, also, today's program will be available on demand viewing at both the Kidney Project and AKP YouTube channel shortly. So follow us at Artificial Kidney and at Kidney Patient to access the recording and please share. And finally, please consider joining AKP at aakp.org join to be kept up to date on the latest regarding the Kidney Project and how you can support this innovation in patient care. Thank you and have a great the rest of your day.